ladies and gentlemen, I think also in the interest of time, we should really be starting. Because today we'll have a marathon session. Um, I'm not sure how this pointer should be working. Let me just check. Yeah. So we have a marathon session. We have, we have 10 or 11 speakers that all will be talking about Terranostics. I discussed the title of the session quite extensively with Beat up front. He kept on changing it back to applications of nanoparticles, but I think there are many more size dimensions that are useful for Terranostics. You can think of Pico probes for molecular imaging or for, for intraoperative surgery, uh, intraoperative imaging, sorry. You can think of nanomedicine, of course. You can think of micro bubbles, scaffold materials for tissue engineering, and they will all be embedded within this session. We'll also have talks on, on the approach that pharma industry uses in the field of Terranostics, as well as on the regulatory authority's view. And what I think is really crucial is that we ideally extensively discuss future directions and strategies to really make a clinical impact with Terranostics. And I think, in, at least in my opinion, that hasn't really started yet. And the challenge in this respect is time, right? Because of the number of speakers with regard to the session, but also when it comes to generating clinical impact. In the clinic, you do not have a lot of time for a diagnostic intervention. If, if you do scanning, you would ideally have the result on, let's say, the same day if you want to apply that to a certain therapy. And also with regard to, to valorization, if, if you want to develop a product or a companion diagnostic tool, you have a limited amount of, of, of time in which you make the benefit out of your product. So time is really something that we have to keep in mind in this regard. And for those of you that do not know what Terranostics is, there are a couple of papers. This is one of the first ones in The Scientist in 2004, in which they define it as a, as a one-two punch that um, combines a targeted diagnostic with a targeted therapeutic. And what they actually see is that Terranostic tests differ from classical combinations of diagnosis and therapy, such as blood glucose, because the tests are based on, on sophisticated technology. I'm not sure how much you know, how relevant that is and how true this definition is, but it really shows that there is quite some work going on in, in, in this area. And this is also shown here. If you put the, in, the, the term Terranostics in PubMed, you get approximately 2,000 hits. The first ones are in the early 2000s, and then for the next seven or eight years, not much happens, right? And only in the last five, six years, you actually see the number of publications really going up. So it's a field that is really expanding exponentially at the moment. And there's even a journal, has been around for three or four years now, it has a good impact factor, so it shows that there is a lot of attractiveness in this field. And, you know, there's actually, sorry, there's even a new journal now by the, by the same publisher on nanoterranostics because there is so much interest from the nanomedicine and nanochemistry community in developing terranostic probes. So if we think about terranostics, what do we want to do with them? What are they for? They're, they're really there, in my opinion, to individualize and improve treatments by combining diagnosis and therapy. And... Right? We, we talked about different dimensions in which you have Terranostics. The first example is a PICO probe. It's just iodine-131. It's just the, the molecular atom iodine, right? In thyroid cancer, you have a range of tumors that overexpress the so-called sodium iodine supporter. If you then use radioactive iodine in, in, let's say, moderate doses, you can detect the tumor, see whether it expresses sufficient amounts of, of this receptor for targeted treatment. And if that, is if that is the case, you increase the dose, and you actually start using this radionuclide therapeutically. So if you do that, you can diagnose and treat with the same construct, right? And you can actually even get, over time, information on the efficacy of treatment. So you can do treatment monitoring all within the same approach. There are also so-called Terranostic pairs. Most well-known is based on DOTA-TOC or DOTA-TATE, which can be labeled both with diagnostic radionuclides and with therapeutic radionuclides. This is an example from um, a somatostatin receptor-positive um, neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas, which metastasizes to the liver. And what people actually do is they first label this, 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 um, this peptide construct with a diagnostic radionuclide so that you do not expose, expose the, the patient too much to, to damaging radiotherapy. You see whether there is accumulation in the, in the lesion, so you basically check whether the somatin receptor, somatostatin receptor is being expressed, and then you start using it for therapy. And actually the lutetium ion that is used in this case for internal radiotherapy can also be monitored. So also during the later stages, during follow-up, you can monitor how efficient your treatment is. This is another nice example of, of a Terranostic pair based on the same construct. Again, some metastatin uh, receptor positive tumors. This is before the treatment. So here they actually took the DOTATOC construct, labeled it with gallium, and all these nodules here, apart from the spleen and the liver, all those nodules are cancer. Right? So this is really highly efficient targeting. We have to keep in mind, though, that targeting here, there's a lot of fuzz at the moment about a 0.7% 0, 0 of, of tumor accumulation that is only achieved with nanoparticles. These percentages are way below that, but they're good enough to induce therapeutic responses. As you'll see here, uh, after three cycles of, of peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, 
the vast majority of the cancerous lesions are gone. Right? So, and also here you can do very efficient treatment and therapy monitoring all with the same Theranostic pair. If we apply this to the nano field, I think what is most relevant here is to keep in mind that we all employ this EPR effect, the enhanced permeability and retention effect, which is necessary to get nano constructs into tumors. And this is really highly variable. It varies very strongly between patient and patient, between patients and mice, between mice and, and, and dogs, for instance. And even within a single patient or within a single tumor, you have quite a high level of variability in leakiness of different blood vessels. And I think we should be using imaging to get a grip on this variability, to figure out which patients to treat. And just, you know, here, here is shown some examples from sarcoma. This is a Kaposi sarcoma. In patients, primary tumors, secondary metastatic lesions here. Very efficient targeting, essentially, in sarcomas. If you go to sarcomas in Labrador dogs, which are also, it's not a tumor model, right? It's a spontaneous, spontaneously uh, growing tumor. There are the tumors actually here, and there is no accumulation in sarcomas in, in dogs. So it really shows that the same tumor entity in different species already has a very different behavior when it comes to leakiness. Head and neck tends to be intermediate, right? Here you have the tumor. This is the heart showing the circulation, liver and spleen. And this is breast. And if we try to generalize things, you can say that breast cancer is not the best of accumulators when it comes to EPR for a number of reasons. So this is what a primary tumor is. And here you actually see that the accumulation in the metastatic lymph node is higher than at the primary side in the breast. What we see is that we get a fair correlation between the extent of EPR and therapeutic efficacy. So there are a couple of studies performed in this Kaposi sarcoma patient population group. The, the, the most important one was at the end of the 1990s, in which people compared doxil, fagulated liposomal doxorubicin, versus adriamycin, which is also doxorubicin, and biomycin and vincristin, and they just had to head compare them. And there they saw that in Kaposi sarcoma, you can double the efficacy. You get more complete responses. You get twice as many partial responses as compared to the, th the, the three standard chemotherapeutic agents given at the same time. And this is arguably because k sarcoma just, you know, not guarantees, but overall shows a pretty high likelihood of EPR. If we go to breast cancer, it needs to be mentioned that Doxel is approved for metastatic breast cancer. It's, it's, it's actually also used relatively extensively in combination treatments in breast cancer. But there the efficacy is not, is not really improved as compared to free doxorubicin. Right? And this is likely due to the fairly low, or, or at least if you try to generalize, fairly low degree of, of EPR that is typical for breast cancer. We're trying to address this also preclinically, of course, to show a correlation between responders or, or between EPR imaging and responses, and to stratify basically responders from non-responders. This work was done with optical imaging, hybrid CT, FMT imaging, where we used a micelle formulation with a taxane labeled with a fluorophore, injected animals, followed them up over several, uh, several weeks, and what you see here is that the clouds in these tumors, so this is a 2D, in green you have a 2D, let's say, section of the tumor. And in these green clouds, you have an overlay of the amount of polymeric micelle formulation accumulating in these tumors. And what you see here is that the tumors are the biggest in the group in which the accumulation of the polymer is the lowest. Right? And vice versa, there where we get reasonably good accumulation of the micelles, we also inhibit tumor growth quite prominently. And to my knowledge, there are actually there are three reports so far that really systematically analyzed uh, this, this concept of correlating accumulation with anti-tumor efficacy. First one was, was years back in radiology. There was one in science translational medicine last year and one by the group of Willem Mulder, who will be giving a talk later on in, in the same session this year, in which they monitor tumor accumulation with PET or with CT, and they correlated the amounts of the drug delivery system that go to the tumor with the eventual response. Right? And that seems to be working fairly well, as you'll also hear later on in, in this session. These are some initial clinical um, applications that were done with Theranostic probes. The probe here is, it was called PK2, proc keel 2 because the probe was developed there. It's a polymer based on HPMA. Doxorubicin is a chemotherapeutic. Galactosamine used as a sugar-based targeting moiety to target this polymeric doxorubicin construct to deliver to hepatocellular carcinoma lesions. This is the passive, sugar-free, polymer, and this is the polymer with, um, with the sugar and with an imaging moiety, obviously. And what you clearly see, this looks spectacular. This looks really good. So we can target the liver very, very well with this polymeric construct. But if you zoom in at, at the liver level, combine CT with SPECT, this is where the healthy liver tissue is. This is this is the solid tumor mass here in the center. And this is where the probe goes. All right, so basically, on the basis of these imaging information, we could have excluded this patient because he or she it's not very likely to go and to develop a therapeutic response. And this, in a way, also shows why fairly disappointing response rates were, were obtained in this study. And they actually only imaged one or two patients for proof of principle. 
I think this is a really nice example that, that also shows how you can use imaging together with targeting for better patient preselection and treatment. Um, this is not cancer, it's not EPR, it's viral nanoparticles for, for gene delivery in cystic fibrosis, where we want to correct a mutated gene. Um, so patients inhale these particles, right? They, they should distribute all over the lung because the whole lung tissue is affected. And if that is the case, if you have a good formulation, it will work, right? And then you could consider, imagine you're in a phase 2A trial, you have 30 of those patients. If you include 20 of those that do not even show good dis distribution or accumulation at the target site, then the final statistical result of 30 patients will be that your product doesn't work, right? Whereas if it's a good product, if you only would have such patients, then it would probably work very well. So we need to figure out ways we need to integrate, in my opinion, in particular imaging biomarkers to get to this situation where we can pre-select patients on the basis of imaging. And indeed, there the, this is the concept, just schematically, you pick out patients that show good accumulation, you treat them with the formulation in question, if it works, you keep on cycling them. And what I think is equally important, you do not treat patients for a long period of time with ed, without any good chances of, um, of success. You can basically, after the first companion diagnostic or teranostic scan, you can exclude patients that are unlikely to show a therapeutic response. And in this context, it is very important to think beyond solid tumor targeting because the vast majority of patients in the clinic are not dying of a solid tumor. They're dying of metastases. And there are no systematic studies on this, but I bet that within metastases, variability is, is well, a log scale higher, right? There are multiple lesions originating in different tissues in, in the brain, in the lung, in the bone, et cetera. They all have a different microenvironment and vessels. So there will be a lot of variability in the amount of nanoformulation that eventually makes it to the target lesion or to the target lesions. And on the basis of imaging in early stage clinical trials, with, which are often done in advanced patients, we can at least get a grip on, on the patient population. We can try to figure out which patients we want to have in clinical trials. And I think the, the value, many people do not know this, but the value of, of teranostic protocols as such, right, or companion diagnostics are different types, tissue uh, biomarkers, liquid biomarkers in blood, imaging biomarkers. It's really shown in, in a lot of studies that were done 10, 20 years ago with molecularly targeted therapeutics, like Herceptin, Trastuzumab, which binds to HER2, it, it, it blocks HER2 signaling. And what you actually see is that in initially, in, in trials, people did not include such a Hercept test, so there was no patient pre-selection. And then you get to percentages, or response percentages of 10%. And that is inferior to taxanes or platins in breast cancer. Right? And only if you try to figure out what the right patients are to treat, so if you do HER2 testing, you get to numbers of 50%, and that then make it spectacular and a blockbuster. So it really shows the, the importance of figuring out what patients to treat. And this can also be done, again, beyond solid tumor markers. Those Hercep test tests, we can only do them in primary tumors for obvious reasons. If we use imaging biomarkers like you know, Herceptin radio-labeled, then we can start looking at metastases. There are multiple metastases here in the neck region. There are a bunch of bone metastases here in breast cancer. In those situations, we can use such imaging biomarkers to figure out whether we want to treat those patients with Herceptin or not. And this can be done with antibodies, also with nanobodies, which have, I would say, preferable kinetics for clinical testing, because this result takes two days, so the patient has to be injected, needs to go home, needs to, uh, needs to come back, and so on. This can be done within one hour. And you can stage, actually, HER2 levels based on, on nanobody-based companion diagnostics. And what I think is... is, is really interesting in this context is that based on such studies that are now ongoing, people that, based on the Hercept test initial test, were negative for the primary tumor, so they would not have received Herceptin, they turn out to be positive for HER2 in a number of metastatic lesions, and then they do get Herceptin. And I think that on the long run, if we systematically do these studies, this will actually really result in improved response rates and survival times. So in this session, I hope that, that all the speakers can, can convince you of the fact that Theranostics probes and protocols are useful for many clinical purposes, right? This goes beyond the size dimensions from surgery to plaque and tumor targeting, brain delivery, triggered release in which you use imaging to get inf information on, on, ter uh, on, on temperature. You can even think of tissue engineering. I'd like to show you one video from the group of Go van Dam. So he was one of the speakers, but he couldn't make it because of a emergency operation that he had to be in today. <laughs> This is on intraoperative um, imaging. I don't think it has been shown a lot at Clena. In all the imaging fields, the WMIC or at the AMIM, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty spectacular. So this is a metastasized ovarian cancer. This is what the surgeon normally sees with, with bright light. And what they do is they use folate fits, right? So no nanoparticle, a pico probe, a pico probe, very small, that then accumulates only in folate recept receptor positive lesions. So you already see it shining a bit here. You'll get the, the zoom in in a moment here. And these are actually the folate receptor positive lesions, right? And based on this theranostic 
information, the, the, the surgeons can now start cutting out those lesions of which we know that they're cancerous. Right? And many of those lesions would have been missed if you just look at the bright light images. And then I think this, this will really also take, take a big leap. It's a question for which types of cancers, of course, but this is really looking very promising from a Theranostic perspective at the moment. And so some of the things I was supposed to officially talk about, I decided to do a more general introduction of, of the whole session rather than focus on tissue engineering. I think also in tissue, tissue engineering, there is, there is a big opportunity to more efficiently integrate imaging and Theranostics. If you label collagen scaffolds for bone tissue engineering, or if you label in this case, textile materials based on, on polymers with iron oxide nanoparticles. You can actually monitor these constructs after implantation. Right? So these are implants into sheep as a shunt between the, the jugular um, vein and the carotid artery. You actually see the construct here. You don't see it here because this is the non-labeled um, uh, other part of, of, of the graft. And you can monitor, for instance, also biodegradation of these constructs over time. So it's very useful also in tissue engineering. So with that, um, I'd like to thank the, the, the people that contributed at least to the tissue engineering work, funding agencies, of course. I'd like to thank this guy here. I think he, he's very valuable for this conference. He, he makes all of this happen. I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take one or maybe two questions. Thank you. If there are no questions, that would actually be pretty good because then we can move on in time. Nobody? If not, I'll pass the floor to Fabian Kiesling. Oh, we're back to this. This is the third talk, so please go to Kiesling. Fabian Kiesling is a professor of radiology and experimental molecular imaging at, uh, at the university where I also work. I can also switch if it's a problem. Would be I, no I problem don't think it's, it's a uh, problem. Can you please put up the Kiesling presentation? Oh, oh we, can, we can also just switch. But it's, it's done. Okay, perfect. Good. Fabian.